Thank you for choosing this Analyst Insight podcast from the Information Security Forum. My name is Mark Ward and this is the second of a series of podcasts that we're doing about Threat Horizon 2024. That's the latest edition of the annual report the ISO produces that considers the dangers, issues, innovations that are going to be troubling InfoSec teams over the next few years. With me today is Paul Watts, who was a CISO for 16 years before joining the ISF as a distinguished analyst. Hello. Thank you, Paul. And also here is Richard Absalom, a principal analyst at the ISF, who was uh, instrumental in helping Paul and myself put the Threat Horizon report together and is a veteran uh, of several uh, of those reports. Hello, everybody. Hi, Mark. Thanks. For I wouldn't me. describe Richard as a, as a veteran. He's very, <laughs> he's very useful. I'd still say grizzled, though. Grizzled through six years of Threat yeah. Horizon reports. <laughs> six years, woo! Yeah, as a, as, a, as a wise old head on those young shoulders, perhaps. Maybe that's the best way to put it. Oh, nicely put, nicely put. I Thanks, like yeah, we'll take that, we'll take that. Yeah. So, this in this podcast, what we're going to talk about is the themes that um, run through the report. And before we dive into those, um, I want us to talk about the uh, backdrop to the whole report. Um, because... For every one we produce, there's typically a moment in time or a sort of particular um, zeitgeist, if you want, that we try to capture, which is the sort of that emerges while we're doing um, the research, while we're talking to people, um, doing um, looking into some of the issues that are going to emerge. And this year, um, the that bigger backdrop um, that out of which all the other threats emerge is something we call the disintegration of trust, very um, uh, ably captured in the cover for the report as well. And uh, the reason that we chose that was because we certainly thought that as we were writing the, the, the threats, um, just considering what the world's going to be like in a couple of years, there does seem to have been a significant change in that trust in the sense we are using it is that unifying force, that faith that um, things will are reliable, that business will continue, that some stability out there um, and that you can trust on your, your suppliers to be uh, to operate in the same kinds of ways, that data is what it what it seems to be, and that you know your training conditions will continue. Um, but we, our growing sense through while writing that report was that's no longer the case, and certainly by twenty twenty four, there's you just will not to be able to have any kind of faith in the regularity, stability, um, those business as usual, um, whatever that means, type um, situation. Richard, Paul, does that capture that broader idea, that backdrop, that shadow out of which everything emerges? Is that, is that a good, good enough summary? Yeah, I think so. And I think what was interesting this year was that theme that kind of brought everything together and all the threats that you guys have been investigating and talking to members about and kind of, you know, gathering in emerged really early. So I've got to say, I think it emerged earlier this year than we've probably seen in previous versions where we try and find something that links everything together. And there was a pretty obvious, yeah, kind of theme from early on that yeah this idea of trust that holds the fabric of society as much as you know the ability to do business to you know hold it all together is yeah definitely starting to crumble it's been pushed and prodded from all sides these days um so to say that by 2024 things are going to be even worse you know it, it, just not being able to know whether to trust what you see in front of you whether you know the, the the, the tech vendors that you work with are trustworthy anyone you know i think that that's going to be under question well, we've proven it, haven't we? I mean, you, you know, we've just we've just come through uh, a pandemic, a, an event I hope I never have to go through again, and we have seen the power that data and information has over society, and and we're generating so much of that data and information, we and, and we're consuming it much more rapidly and quicker, that 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 the ability to validate and verify it just doesn't necessarily exist so we take a lot for granted but that's a fantastic opportunity and fantastic is probably the wrong word to use for exploitation i mean we mentioned in the summary the idea that we thought we were in control of data and it was all about the exploitation of big data i think the reality is we carry on the way that we are the data is going to control us and and there are multiple opportunities for that to be exploited so uh, yeah, you're right. We did we did come to uh, we thought we were onto something very very early on, and the, and, the, and the more we dug, the more we found the broader spectrum of topics that, that we then go on to talk about in the report, Mark. Yeah, I think so because there are two sides to this. I think one is that in some respects it's a sign of maturity. I think because if you no longer trust your data, perhaps that's a good thing. Maybe you trusted it too much, and I think there's been a certain amount of that. And like you say, some of that, some of the bad guys, some of the threats we write about do trade on that ability that assumption that people do trust what they're told 
Uh, and now, unfortunately, yeah, we're all maybe more suspicious for all kinds of reasons, some good, some bad. But I think, yeah, I mean, that's definitely, I think, as to your point as well, Richard, yeah, it's not just for Infosec that this has changed. I think globally as well, there's some bigger changes have gone on that we, we definitely needed to acknowledge here. Yeah, and of course, I always like that point of view from, from Threat Horizon. We have to, you know, couch it in terms of what the world in general is looking like. That's why we, we do that piece at the beginning of the report, looking at, you know, where the world's going in terms of political, environmental, social, technical, you know, point of view. Because, yeah, obviously the threats we talk about have a much wider impact than just um, upsetting some folks in the, in the InfoSec team. Yeah, I, and again, another sign of maturity, I think, that InfoSec teams are expected to have an opinion about those things and could have some, you know, do have useful skills that can be brought to bear on those. I think that, you know, that inclusion in the broader strategy of the business um, as well, I think is important as well. And I think the last couple of reports we've produced have definitely acknowledged that sort of that stepping up by InfoSec teams and practitioners, just as you know, what, what they're likely to be asked about and talk about. But I think just to move, quickly move on to our first big theme for the report, um, which has the title, Well-Intentioned Regulations Have Unintended Consequences. And we've done a couple of webinars about um, the report and uh, as one of the comments in the webinar said, well, hasn't that always been the case that, that regulators rarely get it right? And I think that's true, but, but I think it's just got worse i think there's you know there's just uh, to your point paul about the amount of data out there and um you know what organizations are doing with it and what regulators are trying to stop them doing with it or would like them to do with it that's where everyone's being caught out yeah i think um i think the difference that we have now is is the speed in which everything is happening the speed of innovation technically non-technically the speed of the creation of the data economy, you know, 175 zettabytes by 2025 is just an astounding amount of, of data um, and of information. And, you know, this has been a problem for law lords and regulators for a long, long time. I remember very early on, back in the mid 80s, the case of Robert Schifrin and Steve Gold, the, uh, the notorious Prince Philip Prestel hack of 1984. And what was interesting with that one was... Uh, the, the legislators struggling to find the right laws to um, punish because the reality was there wasn't anything. And in the end, I think uh, they, they were uh, they were prosecuted on a, on a very minor misdemeanor to do with uh, the, the, the use of a tool for fraudulent purposes or some BS like that. And anyway, you kind of fast forward. Computer Misuse Act of 1990 came to pass. Um, and we find ourselves complaining about that even now, you know, that, you know, that act is not fit for purpose. But as quickly as we bring that up to date, the world will have moved on again. You know, you pivot that into some of the conversations we have in the report about the regulation of uh, of algorithms and artificial intelligence. The, the same thing occurs, but because of the way that uh, the way that the world operates now, you've got a balance between uh, legislating against moral and ethical and, and wrongs. You know, to get that that, that balance of, uh, of of risk and reward right, but you also have geopolitics over the top of that as well now. So legislation that might be applicable in one region isn't applicable in another. Completely changes the dynamic of what you're trying to do. So it's a real melting pot of, uh, of, of, of challenges that they have to keep up with in this day and age. Yeah, I think so. I think certainly organisations have outrun regulations in all kinds of ways because a lot of them are quite fleet footed. They're quite fast moving. They're trying to do things fast and they recognise they need to. But I think reg often those regulators, those laws, those guidelines just don't fit what they're trying to do with them and you know and there's some very difficult conversations as a result um but i think as well that sense as well that regulation is changing too and that there is a recognition by the regulators that they that there is real harm here as well and that's what they want to try and curb but again like you say in different places harm is viewed in different ways and that makes it very difficult for any large organization to to, to, to get this get this right everywhere that harm wears different hats, hmm. doesn't it? So you you can talk about the harm that legislation brings to you, you know the desired outcomes. The harm also is brought to organisations on the bleeding edge. So if you're an organisation that's 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 really trying to ride the crest of, of of new modern ways of doing business, and then you find the regulators coming up behind you and almost shattering and saying, "Well, actually, you can't do that anymore." That rework, that repurposing, and that lost cost. You know, that's a bit of a disincentive for people to to innovate and, and and step on that bleeding edge. I mean, that, that that can't be good for anyone, right? No, definitely not. I think certainly with um, 
European views on so the algorithms and things like that, they are actually going to outlaw some uses in some places. And that again, they have very good reasons for that, historical reasons for doing that. But in China, they, they're going very much the other way. They do want organizations to harness this kind of stuff for a very particular social good. And it, but as well, I think it's, it's not clear to me as well that any of those regulators are talking to each other. There's certainly no coordination. There's so many different ways that these things are being characterized that, yeah, any organization that wants to try and navigate through that thicket, take a big machete. It's going to take a lot of work to get to, to, to cut through all that and, and get it right, I think, for sure. But you're also, yeah. you're also in situations where you're trying to regulate things that were not designed to be regulated. I mean, cast yep. your mind back to the big debates around net neutrality, for example. You, you, you know, the, uh, the, the people who, in quotes, govern and try and manage that behemoth that is the internet, you know, very much pushed back and said, you know, the, there was some paranoia around it. You know, why do we need this? You know, there's a commercial overtone here and that's not what the internet was about. This is about, you know, free speech and blah, 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 blah. And you, you've got to you've got to deal with all of that as well. Sorry, Rich, I talked over you there. I no, that's what I mean. I was just going to say it might be a slightly unpopular view, but I'm starting to feel a bit sorry for the regulators around here, because especially if you look at oh. some, of the, some of the threats we're talking about. But, you know, the well, let's take the one in particular on ransomware, the evolution of ransomware, right? And we're saying that's, that's partially coming around because regulators and uh, law enforcement are rightly trying to crack down on what is, you know, the biggest cyber threat right now. But, you know, what we're saying, that that's going to have unforeseen consequences and that's going to happen with, you know, in the spaces, yeah, like we've been talking about um, around AI, cyber, yeah, um, kind of cryptocurrencies as well sorry but yeah particularly ransomware you know it's gonna it's what we, any kind of law enforcement is just going to push push the threat off in a different potentially more dangerous direction so it's a kind of yeah it, it's always going to feel like a, a never-ending battle right there's you're always going to be one step behind from a from a regulatory point of view yeah. Yeah, I think I think feeling sorry for them is quite going to be a divisive comment, and I love to see feedback <laughs> on that. But As I, I said, know, I know we, I know where yeah. you're coming from with that. Uh, you, you know, because society looks to its led to, looks to legislators to, to govern and, and control and manage, and, and if they're not doing that, they get disdain. If they overburden, or in some cases, and you see the Congress behaviour when they pull Zuckerberg and, uh, and and others into a room, you know, their lack of knowledge and understanding of what they're trying to regulate and legislate against is equally as as dangerous so you, you know challenges from from all directions there i think yeah i think like, who'd be a regulator yeah. I mean, it's a difficult job i think we can at least acknowledge that we're moving on so um the second thing we have is about technology choices dis diminishing control that's the title we gave it and this is very much to do with the again unintended consequences in some respects about some very good technologies that organizations are starting to deploy for very good reasons they're very potent type technologies i use that word a lot it's a, it's a favorite one of mine and i think they they do have good things but as well they bring with them some dangers and that's what we try to acknowledge here and again i sort of they can diminish that trust because um a lot of what they try to do is certainly with uh, regard low code and no code it's it, try it's um, moving that development effort outside the control of IT and infosec, and definitely that's there's a real consequence there, and you do definitely lose control. But it, again, is it? It's the trust here that you know you can you know you can set up that those um, those good that good culture to get people to do the right things, and yet we find that technology regularly just catches organisations out again, doesn't it? It's you know it's it, it, the innovation just keeps coming. There's there's a there's a line between trust and control, right? Um, and I've been particularly interested in the the, the idea of uh, you know the cloud risk bubble bursting. This idea of a of a, of a quasi hostage scenario. You know, when I was uh, when I was CISO in the financial services sector, one of the things I I took a bit of comfort in, if that's the right word, is I had oversight of tin to tip. Everything was under our jurisdiction. The team we were running on to the networks, to the data centers, the applications, the users, the whole kit and caboodle. You move that stuff out into cloud, all right? And you move that stuff into uh, into third party services. Some of that control is diminished and you trust that they're going to do the right thing by you. Now, we just had a torrid time over the last couple of years and organizations who were thinking about going hybrid, going cloud, you know, found themselves in difficulty because they were sat in that on-premise world and we suddenly took all the soldiers, moved them outside of the castle. You know, that's so so you can see the short-term benefits of leveraging that, but there is a degradation of control as a consequence. And what you start to do is you trust that the vendor or vendors are going to do the right thing by you. Now, 
when that trust is tested by outages and we, you know, we, we tracked some of the notable outages over the course of the last 18 months, they're the same failure modes that we used to have when we had control, you know, poor change, bad configuration, fire, flood, blah, blah, blah. But your ability to do anything about that is gone. And what do you tell your CEO when you say, well, actually, I can't, can't control that anymore. I'm at the mercy of somebody that I trusted would do the right thing by me. That's an awkward, bordering conversation. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think as well on the operational side, um, I think we've got a colleague, Paul Holland, who's doing some work on those industrial control systems. And again, yeah. for very good reasons, a lot of remote management has been put in place around those, but even though they are hard to manage. But again, I think there's some hostages being made there because um, the activists, those highly motivated individuals are keen to exploit some of those links because you know that attack surface is definitely multiplied and people are getting desperate. And I think, unfortunately, that's one thing we did pick out in, as a theme in the report is just that background of turmoil, social, political, environmental activism is just definitely going to be rumbling away in the background and that's going to cause a lot of trouble for organizations well i mean you can you can do a lot of damage with very little effort if you uh, if you attack the digital sphere and you, you know that's the crux of the activism threat you know if you start seeing organizations with digital sprawl bringing remote sites into the mix that's your that's your weaker link that's you know the opportunities to exploit that are, are pretty significant i guess yeah. Richard, I was just going to ask you in terms of sort of technologies you've seen and innovations you come through, because I suppose, I mean, the, the upside of this is that these technologies are being used for good reasons. I mean, it's not like they're all bad. It's just that they have, mm -hmm. you know, trailing edges and bleeding edges, and that's what organizations have yeah, to cope I mean, with. Exactly. So obviously we were looking specifically at, you know, cloud and, you know, low code, no code, and, and for very good reason, business want to pick that up, you know, around agility, elasticity, you know, just able to spin up processes you know very quickly and you know get get new applications out so there's there's very good reason from a business point of view you want to be able to move that quickly um but yeah they you think about these technologies they inherently demand trust you have to trust that they're going to work and and yeah as paul says when when they don't when there's outages or when you know some bad code slips into the logo no code platform there's yeah kind of massive vulnerabilities there so it's um and, and it goes back to this point you, you know what we we have to be able to trust those things to be able to do business but you can't <laughs> it gets to a point you know people it's been interesting especially talking about the big cloud vendors you know this has come up a lot in some of the work i've done around supply chain you know there's a bit of an argument around how can how far can you assure big suppliers you know the the, the, the big tech vendors big cloud service providers in particular because they're the least likely to let you do things like audits and self assessments, you know, you pretty much, and, and they're not going to change their terms and conditions when you want to work with them. So, you know, for, for some people, they'll say, actually, do you know what, in the end, we're not going to test those guys too much, we trust them, they've got the, the processes in place. And they largely do, they spend more on, on security than pretty much anyone else. And they, they know it's in their interest to do so. But that doesn't stop things going wrong. You know, nothing's ever 100% secure. Um, and you, yeah, you really just got to acknowledge that risk. Yeah, because do you, do you not also think that, that there's, there's an additional challenge there in the, the right to portability? So, you know, when, you, when you're running tin to tip, you know, you want to you change data center provider, you, you know, you, you've got the capacity to do that. Yeah. If you put all your eggs in one big cloud provider basket, they're not really that interested in portability. So right. how, how do you, how do you leverage right. your consumer <laughs> choice and freedom to move from A to B to C? You just can't, yeah. can you? Well, they're, they're actively, uh, obviously, you know, it doesn't make sense for their business to, to let you do that as easily as possible because they want to lock you into the, <laughs> to the whole platform. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, yeah, it's deliberately going that way. And you can see it's for them it's a virtuous circle for, for businesses who want to be able to move it's a bit of a vicious circle of yeah if you but if you move away from one of those providers you're, you're likely to get locked into another right yeah, yeah. well and, and and that's the challenge that i you know you, you have in low code i mean your, your nightmare scenario is always something that happens at the foundational level so if you find your application you know a lot of its shadow technology shadow applications are being developed on a low code no code platform that you then can't move away from easily without destabilizing the whole organization or you have the dreaded low level vulnerability. I mean, you're trusting those providers to, um, you know, to be doing the right thing by you. But the minute they don't, the exposure is yours. You know, that risk is yours. I, I don't know, Mark, I know you've looked at that quite extensively in terms of low code, no code. I don't know what your thoughts are. Yeah, on I think at the moment, certainly there's a lot of no code, low code platforms out there. Um, and I suspect we're in that expansion and we'll soon be in the contraction phase. And then a lot of organizations will be caught out because suddenly a lot of the stuff that they used will disappear or be acquired or no longer supported. And suddenly I think, the, it'll be obvious that there are big chunks of their organizations being run by the, 
um, aspect, sorry, third parties out there, they just did not know about and now have no control over and the assets are gone. So I think, yeah, we're in a difficult phase there for sure. And certainly by 2024, I mean, there's all kinds of estimates about how many, um, how much uh, code is going to be written beyond IT departments or beyond development um, methodologies. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a scary amount for sure. Anyhow. So just yeah. on that, we, we were talking a couple of days ago about, um, I can't remember when this conversation was, but hear me out. A, a, a friend of mine in the industry kind of dropped a hypothetical question about DevSecOps and said, if, if DevSecOps gets really, really robust and strong, why do you need centralized security teams? And it kind of got me thinking about the conversations we were having around low code and no code. You almost, it almost feels like you're always going to need that, that independent internal arbitrator just to make sure that you've got that balance between kind of trust and assurance absolutely tip top. I don't know if you guys have got any thoughts on that. Yeah, I think there's always going to be a need for um, that good practice and you know, showing the way in some respects, because I think developers, you know, for all their skills and um, all the good that they do, I think sometimes they need a bit of direction. And I, and I think as well, the some of the newer tools, the AI tools, again, are very strong, very useful, and developers doubtless will adapt them, adopt them and use them because they'll speed things up for them and solve some of those tricky coding problems. But again, you're handing some your control over to something. So you need to set some boundaries and some rules. And I think that's that's always going to be a something you can only do out beyond the, those developer um, groups or you know, functions within organizations. Yeah, I think it needs that oversight. Yeah, because I, I mean, maybe in an ideal world or an ideal future world, you, you wouldn't need that central uh, IT or infosec function because everyone else has it built into their processes, into their mindset, thinks about, you know, considers it, all the developers will consider it during that, that time. At, at the moment, probably a, a good place to be is for an infosec team to be that kind of arbiter and um, promoter and champion of good practice, I guess, because you're not going to be able to, you know, generally in, in the real world, the budget and the size of the team is you don't have a view over everything yeah. that everyone is doing. Absolutely. But kind of setting that good practice and providing some oversight is, yeah, is going to be it's a, a key task. Part. It's, yeah. It's definitely a conversation that I'd be interested in having with members going forward. I mean, not really one for now, but uh, if you've got any thoughts on that, uh, you know, what you think the future of centralized versus decentralized security teams are, um, why not drop a comment, isflive.org, and, uh, you know, we can have the conversation there. I, I think it would be interesting to float that topic, but yeah. uh, I don't want to digress from Threat Horizon, Mark, so uh, let's come back to talking. Yeah, um, let's dive into that third theme, um, dirty data disrupt biz disrupts business. Um, and this very much felt like the foundational problem for the whole report, really, just that you can no longer trust the data you get um, and use for your organization, call it lifeblood, call it you know, or, you know the oil that you use, the plutonium that um, powers your you know, the reactor of your enterprise or something like that, whatever you, however you want to characterize it. But it, data is fundamental to what organizations do. And I think it's our contention that you just can't trust it anymore. Where is it coming from? Who's giving it to you? Or you know, what, how, is it pure? Does it have integrity? All those naughty issues definitely are getting coming to a pinch point. I'm getting you a t-shirt, mate. It's going to say data <laughs> is life. <laughs> You just like, that's going to be data. I'm just seeing you now in, with, with chief data offices around you going, I've seen the light. Data is light. Well, I think, I mean, there are, certainly um, we we do I had, have, have had that conversation about organizations being afloat on a sea of data and that and they have to pilot and navigate their way. And the, she's, the seas are shifting and it sometimes there's very big waves. And, you know, like I say, well, however you characterize it, but it's it's right there in everything that organizations do. I mean, I find this topic absolutely fascinating, and we could talk about this for hours. And maybe one of the when we do the deeper dives, we can go into into this in a bit more um, detail. But I kind of come back to the traditional, uh, you know, tenets of information and cybersecurity. We talk about confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and we've had this obsession to worry about availability and confidentiality. And we've had many notable examples of, you know, why that's important to us. But I think integrity becomes the new battleground, right? I mean, if you've got so much data flying past you at such a rate of speed that you can't assure it, and you're just trusting that that data is giving you the right answers, integrity, I mean, that's got to be the new battleground. And and, and I, I, I don't think or I don't necessarily believe that all organizations have invested the time they need, certainly in unstructured data, 
to have the right methods of assurance when they're consuming that data, you know, be it their data or, or data they're sourcing from a third or fourth party. You know, you want to poison that data well, there's nothing in place to, to say, hang on a minute, this data is not telling me what I expect it to tell me. I smell a rat. You just consume that data. You take it for granted. Garbage in, garbage out. Yeah, and that's that's only going to get more important when we think over the coming years and what what the technology is that's going to drive business forward, drive innovation and processes. It you know AI, machine learning, whatever you want to call it, it all relies on good data. You know, if you want to get any decent kind of output from this new tech, you need to have very good, very clean, yeah, just accurate data. And I mean, yeah, uh, and it's used so quickly. There's yeah, what what chance do you have of of providing assurance over it? Um, I think there was a stat we were talking about the other day, Paul. You said um, is it something like thirty percent of the data that's being created at the moment is used instantly? Correct. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, and that's that's incredible when you think about it. There's, there's, how do you, you we're going to have to try and work towards a point where you can assure things, assure data in real time. It's almost kind of like you know, real time fact checking yeah. at a at a micro level. Yeah. Well, certainly, I think with all the work on machine learning, what that's taught us is that data is not neutral, and you really do have to consult you know, its sources and where it's coming from. And obviously, we've got in the background to all this, you know, whenever you go on any web page these days, just you know, you can scare yourself to death by looking at how many cookies, how many trackers are there, what are they looking for. The the journey that you take through a website is absolute gold mine, and that all that information is being gathered, it's being um, sold off, and there's a vast chunk of you know, that data economy exists because of that. So it's clearly very important, valuable stuff, but it's not neutral for sure. I think that, and that's where the regulators step in again. They, they've realised that that you know the uses to which it can be put are sometimes good, but often and bad and blindly bad in that the organizations don't realize what, what that data where it's taking them for sure but it's interesting it kind of takes me back to the conversation we were just having about regulations so you know interesting i i use i use my family as a bit of a test bed uh which 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 they hate but now that's what you get for living with a security professional but what i found really really interesting is they never really understood what cookies are where what do they do what do they not do what's their relevance to me and the legislation's then kind of kept up or caught up, and it now says you want to put a cookie on someone's machine. You've got to tell them what it's there for, why it's going to do. You know, and you're starting to see that friction hitting UX. And and you know, my wife and my kids get really annoyed with that, and they go, "Well, cookie choices? Nah, want to hit the green accept button because I want to get on and do what I do." So, you know, regulatory compliance. We're ticking the boxes. We're giving the people the choice, but we're using the friction almost as an enticement to ignore what we're telling them surely that, that that can't be right and again you know opportunities to misinform and misdirect by using you know that that friction and, and driving that friction against the impatience of society now you know i, I find that quite interesting as well you you, you know you've, you've got to have this this balance between caveat emptor and um and having a fluid experience online and if you get that wrong then you know people will go and use your competitor's website it's a it's a tightrope to walk i think yeah i think so certainly with um i know again in europe um there are big pushes now to really clamp down on the amount of personal data that's being gathered. And that'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Certainly Facebook has suffered because of Apple's move to limit that tracking. Um, their share, share price and is severely dented as a result of um, some of that. So it, again, I mean, that, and that proves the value of this stuff. If you can wipe 20% of Facebook's share price, then yeah, that's valuable stuff that clearly that, that they're, stop, they're stopping getting. But I think as well, I mean, as someone who, tried in vain many times to preserve their privacy. I've not quite given up, but you know, I do what I can. And I think that's part of the problem here is just um, my data is not really my data anymore. It's data about me that other people want and, uh, and that they get it in many different ways, then it's impossible for me to, to, to navigate that. I just going back to something Richard said, you know, he was right in, you know, 30% of this data is being consumed in, in real time. What I found quite striking in the research I did, and IDC, I think, quoted this number that 90 zettabytes of that 175 zettabytes of data by 2025 will be being created and or consumed by Internet of Thing devices. You know, this is a largely newer phenomenon. So you're talking about a sprawl of, you know, non-computer devices. Dare I say that, the concept of Internet of Things. And they're, 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 they're slurping that data, they're spewing that data out, and they're doing that in real time. And if you think about how we then consume that data and react to it, and we talk about cyber fusion centers, and we talk about digital twins, the opportunity to just just manipulate that data to, and you know back to that that concept of control to get people to dance the way you want them to dance 
you know, that 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 that, that absolutely fractures the, the trust model. I know Digital Twins was a particular favourite of yours, Mark. And you know, I don't know thoughts on thoughts on where we're going with digital twins. I mean, we can't we can't not trust industrial control systems. That no. are, well, yeah, I, you know, I, really, I did like that because it's a bit science fictional because it's has that um, those connections between the, the end product. Um, I think one of the examples we used was a car maker and then real time data being fed back from the cars to the digital twin. So you can model it before you put it into production and improve, you know, get that virtuous circle of gradual improvement to uh, the, the, the whatever you're making. Um, but I think, I mean, just to, just to try and round off some of this, because we are painting a bit of a bleak picture here, you know, it's sort of dirty data, it's unintended consequences, there's technology that's outrunning your controls and organizations in, in peril in some respects. But is it is it all bad, Richard? Should we throw up our hands in despair and, and give up now? Or is there, you know, what, what, is there a way out of this? Big question. Well, very well, yeah, <laughs> talking to, generally talking to InfoSec professionals, we don't tend to be the uh, uh, <laughs> the most positive bunch. <laughs> what are you but, saying? Oh, I don't know, Paul. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, no, I mean, the, to be honest, I don't know if we had the answer, um, we'd, we'd surely say. But yeah, I mean, we, we asked the question right at the end of the report, you know, what, what, where do we go now? And I think we use the phrase tipping point in the, the 2023 report. So I don't want to talk about that again, necessarily. But you know, there's, there's this, as every you know, the future's not written, there's, 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 this could go at least one of two ways, you know, is, but I think there's decision to make from not just infosec professionals, but you know, kind of business leaders as well. Do we do we give up on this concept of trust? Do we now have to start applying something like zero trust to every walk of, of life? You know, let alone you know as a, as your key security principle. Um, but but also, yeah, you know, I think we've we've got to start thinking how do we start to to rebuild that as well. So how can we actually start to gain more trust? Is you know, if we can build security into the IoT from the ground up, for instance, does <laughs> does that start to help? Um, because you know, suddenly you you, were able, you know you're able to trust the data that's coming from these connected devices everywhere. So yeah, there's lots of work to do. I think if if we're going to go that way, um, but yeah, there's, it's a legitimate choice to make, and that, yeah, I don't have the answer. <laughs> No, but I think, like you say, asking it's asking the question, isn't it? And I think there is some real work to do in that um, the future is not set, and there are zero trust and other methods can be found to try and get some trust back or at least reassure yourself that things are going in the right direction. But I, th I think as well, there is the, the excitement of this is that organizations have become much more dynamic and the, the, the way they're going and the way they're working takes skill and it's a bit of a wild knuckle, white knuckle ride sometimes. But I think being part of that, I mean, that's, again, some of the attraction of being involved in this kind of stuff, isn't it? So that's why you do it. You know, it's not Serena Williams does not play tennis just so she can win every time. She wants to be challenged. And I think for InfoSec folks, that's part of why they do it. Isn't it? Paul, is that why you did it? Because you like to be like problems to solve and <laughs> no, I mean, it, it turns out I, I came into InfoSec because I'm a moody git, um, which uh, I, I, I will be uh, reminding Richard of on a regular basis. I knew, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, all seriousness, you, you, you know, tr trust trust has a part to play. Um, but I think when you think about it in the concept of risk and threat management, I think you now have to have clear markers where you are making the conscious decision to trust. And you need to constantly remind yourself that you are taking for granted the integrity of inputs that you are consuming to elicit output. Uh, and it's as simple as that. Um, you know, we we talked about last year, uh, this, this reaching a bit of a tipping point. I think by 2024 on current projections, you know, that control is completely lost and, and trust is basically you know, a big part of our lives and, and the opportunity for exploitation is great. I think the time is now for organisations to to selectively choose where they, they want to put trust in place and where they believe the price or the cost is too high. Then zero trust architectures and that sort of method of never trust but verify through people, process and technology has to be a part of enterprise. And But it's a constantly moving feast and it's constantly dynamic. We have to get the balance right to continue to be highly innovative highly agile business and enterprise without tripping over our shoelaces uh, in the process. It's what we've said time and time and time again when we talk about risk management. Shift the conversations to the left, go into and making those decisions, do it with your eyes wide open and know where you want to trust and accept and know where you want to verify, comply and assure and just get that balance right. I, I, I think there is still opportunity to make the best of both worlds. Thank you.
Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Richard. Um, and thank you to everyone for listening. You can find more podcasts on the ISF podcast channel or at securityforum.org, where you can also learn more about ISF research tools and guidance.